And uh, those that are coming in online, uh, you're at home, uh, either because you live in the UAE or some other part of the world, and you're part of our uh, global network, and so we welcome you. But if you're at home and you're sick with COVID, I'm going to pray for you in a minute. If you're home and you're frustrated, restricted by COVID, we are going to pray for you in a minute. Uh, but otherwise, welcome to what we're doing today. And uh, for those that uh, aren't familiar with Freedom House, uh, we have a website where you can find out more about us, our vision uh, and our values at www.freedomhouse.net.au. And um, what's going to happen going forward for everyone is that these meetings being recorded up for the library, so there's a series of teaching because uh, it's my experience that when I get going, uh, you won't be able to take in everything. Um, and we will use that then as a tool to mentor into the teaching as we go. So there'll be a recording um, and that'll be available to everyone that just goes to our site or goes to the YouTube channel. Uh, I never thought we would have a YouTube channel, but apparently it's really easy to the spring, so there's no big deal with it. But uh, it needs some of the experience like Ahsoka just set it up for us. Um, let me just um, say this too, that for those that are viewing, uh, our goal is to use these Sunday meetings as an equipping meeting, to, to teach, to equip, to activate, to allow the Spirit of God uh, to bring revelation to us, to plunge deeper into the Word of God. Uh, as the alignment for how we live. We believe that the church is built on the foundations of the uh, apostles and prophets with Christ the cornerstone and the capstone. And I'll come to why we feel that impetus is being outworked more and more in this age. Um, and I think it will become clear from the message today that I want to bring to you, I'm going to bring it in two parts. Uh, if I give it to you all today, we'll get out at 6 o'clock. Uh, so I thought I'd break it up into two sessions for you, uh, and I'm going to lay a foundation for you, uh, first of all, about how we are called to be leaders into the world. Every believer is called to be a leader into the world. Now, you might not have seen yourself that way, you might not have felt that way, but that's exactly what God calls them to demonstrate through the Scriptures. And another way that Jesus puts it, uh, is that we are called as a church, a collective whole, to be a city on a hill. And each of us is to be salt and light into the world. And if you've been around the church for a little while, you've probably heard this message a few times. But I hope that I can shed some different light on it uh, today uh, to activate you uh, into saying, I want to go on with this. I want this to become my reality in a world that right now is shaking. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to try and link a few things together for you to give you uh, some clarity, some, uh, a solid foundation in Christ, and then some tools, practically, how you can live this life out as light and salt into an environment that is dark, that is in disorder, uh, that is culturally living by a different set of values. And it, it, it does worry me a little bit that the church is shaking with the world. In other words, the spirit of fear that is dominating the world at the moment, unfortunately, is also gripped at various parts of the church. And, and I want to show to you that Jesus was never gripped by fear. Ever. He was always sustained in loving faith of the Father because he knew him. He knew his Father. He knew the power of his words. He knew that what he was called to, and he stayed in course. And so he understood that light is made for darkness. See, the church is trying to get rid of the darkness instead of being light in the darkness. And, and the darkness doesn't go until Revelation 20, 21. That's a long time away. In other words, we, we are to then live by something and live by someone through our salvation experience that empowers us and, and has anointed us to live in the world. So I'm going to uh, unpack that uh, very shortly. But I just... Um, I want to pray with you firstly, and for those that are watching online. Every year, um, for the last 15 years that I've been leading the work, um, I, I have set the Christmas break as a time where I get the call and I want to hear his heart for the city ahead. 
And it, it's pretty clear that uh, for those that have been pioneering the rest of Freedom House, we have mapped out our family vision, a set of values, and a culture we're working through, taking small steps towards that big vision. But in any one season of God, there seems to be an emphasis of what He's doing. If you've got ears to hear and eyes to see and heart to understand. And that is the, the, the emphasis He is going to bring upon that community of believers to outwork their vision. It doesn't take away the vision, it's an emphasis for the vision to be established. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? And so when, when I was praying, I said, Lord, what is it about 2022? 2022. Uh, and I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, it, it's John 2022. Now, what's really important about John 2022 is everything that we have been teaching through uh, and discipling each other in is the greater work of the Spirit, the revelatory realm of the kingdom of heaven. And what John 20, 22 says very simply is this. And after he said that, Jesus, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this is not the day of Pentecost. This is their born again experience. And John 20, 22 is unpacked further uh, in Luke. And this is what it says in Luke. And he said to them, these are the words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. So Jesus has taught them. He's gone to the cross. He's destroyed all the works of the enemy. He's come back in resurrection, but not yet glorified before the Father. He's in resurrection power. And now he wants to tell them what matters the most. For 40 days, he doesn't preach ecclesiology. For 40 days, he doesn't say, how are you going to dismantle the Roman Empire? For 40 days, he teaches nothing but the kingdom of heaven. That is the good news that we are to live in and reveal to the words, and if necessary, use words. If necessary, use words. And I'll explain to you why when we come to what salt and light are and how the Bible explains itself around those things. And so he, he, he says, these are the words I spoke to you that I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then verse 45 becomes the key for us. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And then he taught them. There is a breathing on the church, I believe, in this hour to lift a veil, to lift the veil that has blinded us and dulled our heart and our senses to the revelation we could be living in and the revelation we should be carrying into the world that we become salt and light. And so I really felt this was an opportune time to bring this message. I brought this numerous times before, but I've never, I've got to say to you, I've never quite joined the dots this way. So even if the Lord is saying to me, I want to show you things differently in this season. I want to join the dots of the revelation you previously understood in a different way and a more profound way so that you can go and live them out. Here's the reality of that revelation. God doesn't do it so that you can puff yourself up in some religious knowledge. He does it so it's transformative in your life that it actually renews your mind to change the pattern of your thinking so it changes the empowerment of your living. He, God is all about you coming into your prophetic destiny and fulfilling God's purposes. So uh, in that regard, I'm, I've often spoken about uh, sensing the time prophetically and God does move in seasons and there are timelines that move circular through generations. It, it, it's not linear. And, and Brett's forehead has just dropped down there, so I better explain that. What that means is this: that 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 each cycle, each cycle of time, you will go through a pattern, but you are not going through it to go lower. You're going through it to go higher. In other words, it's circular, and and every generation or every couple of generations will repeat, but with another depth of revelation what a previous generation went through. In other words, is it new that that government is, is behaving oppressively in the world? No. Hello. 
But if you go through the history books, then you would say, oh, there it is, there it is, there it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's nothing new under the sun. And the Bible gives us a course and a way through all of it. And so I want you to see the connection between a number of points that is prophesied by Isaiah that I'm going to talk about in the context of being a leader in the world and being a soul and light. And these threads will come through. So you, I hope you've got a bit of thinking going on today. Um, and I can turn up the air conditioning and make it really cold in here, so you do. Uh, <laughs> I don't want it too long because you guys, it's the after lunch session. So um, Isaiah 60 says this, Arise, shine. Now, now, what's the first thing you've got to do? Arise. You've got to stand up or wake up, whichever case it is. But when you get out of bed, you've got to stand up. Right? You, you've got to wake up and stand up. Wake up and stand up. Arise. And he says this, shine. Be light. Be salt. Change that which is around you. That's what salt does. I'll take you through that. Light is made for darkness. Let me prove it to you. Arise, shine, for your light arrives. Oh, what's that light? It's the glory of Jesus. Arise, shine, for your light arrives. The splendor of the Lord shines on you. This was the old ironic prayer. But now it's transformed into a prophetic future of a people that are going to live in Christ. Now watch what happens here. For look, darkness covers the earth. And great darkness covers the nations. What has God made for the darkness? The light. He's made the light for the darkness. Who's meant to be in the light? You and I. We're not meant to be in the darkness. Arise, shine, get a grip, refocus, stand up, lay hold your prophetic destiny, come back into alignment with your union with Christ because the glory of God dwells within you. You are the light and salt into the darkness. I'm not removing the darkness. You're going to transform the darkness. Who's channeled mildly by that word? Yeah, so here we go. And so, look, the darkness covers the earth and deep covers the nation. Deep darkness covers the nations. But the Lord shines on you. How many times has that been said? It's like it's, it's a trumpet call. It's a clarion call. The Lord shines on you. His splendor appears over you. That's an anointing. That's the presence of God. Nations come to your light. Kings come to your bright light. Kings come to your bright light. What's the design here? What's the intent? God has not changed his intention since Genesis. How many of you have read in the Bible that the opening stanza and we get a picture that the Holy Spirit is brooding over what? Darkness. And God speaks. His first word, let there be light. He's not talking about the sun and the moon because that comes later. Who's he talking about? Behold my sun and my government order. Behold my glory. Then from that, everything came into creative order. Are you with me? Now, has that changed? No. So if you're in the light and you carry the light, what's the light made for? Darkness. Then why are we keeping the light under a bushel? Why are we keeping the light in a conclave and a holy huddle and separating ourselves from the assignment that God's presented to us? So I, I, I just want to unpack that and, and let you see that really what's going on in this season of darkness and calamity is not new, but God hasn't changed his mind about how we're to live in that reality like every other generation before us 
in every other generation after us, except we get to steward something that breaks open something for the next generation to walk in. If we trade in fear, we can't walk in the light. Fear is darkness. So I'm going to take you through a whole lot of things, um, but before we do that, I just want to, I want to pray together. Because if anything that I'm saying is resonating to you, if anything that I'm saying is capturing your heart, and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now, which I suspect you may be, then we need to pray that word into reality. Is, is anyone with me? Yeah. 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 You're allowed to use animation. Yeah. Um, you're allowed to look alive. Um, you know, I don't. I'll just sit down with you and show you how you look right now. <laughs> just, I'm, I'm talking about light and life, and I'm looking for it. <laughs> I don't know she's outstanding. <laughs> but but do you see what I'm saying? If um, can, I, can I just give you a hint? This can be really joyful. Mm-hmm. It can be really joyful to walk in the light, in fact, one of the fruit of the spirit. Uh, and that's how you know you're walking in the light, because you're really, really happy mm-hmm. despite being <laughs> in adversity. Yes. Mm-hmm. Hello? Yeah. Because you're not living from the world around you, you're living from the Word living in you. That's the shift that we've got to take. So that's what we're going to pray for right now. I just think it's a funny beautiful. <laughs> Father, we just thank you for this afternoon. We thank you for the power of your Word. We know it's like a double-edged sword that pierces bone and bone. It goes into the depth of our heart. And Lord, we're just longing to hear what you have having to say today. And Lord, if this is your Word... Father, let it be established in us that this is the emphasis you want to bring for this season for whoever's listening. Father, let it be established. Bring the spirit of revelation, wisdom, and understanding. Impart to us things that we haven't yet seen. Lift the veil from our eyes and our ears and our heart that we may arise and shine, that we may arise. Lord, whatever we have been locked up in, Lord, today, liberate us. Whatever we have given ourselves to, Lord, let us disentangle ourselves from it. But Father, let us see the prophetic destiny, the hope, and the reality of what can be established in the world when a church chooses to live in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I'm going to lay a foundation uh, for a little while, and I'm going to take you through some scriptures. Um, and I notice one person has their Bible, which is really encouraging for me. So the rest of you will listen to this a few times or you'll go to your iPad or something. But can I just say this going forward? It, it, it may pay, because this is an equipping type of church and it's more of a teaching church than me giving you um, something casual. You may need to take some notes uh, or bring your Bible or your iPad uh, or something that's got some biblical reference on. So you can go through it with me. What I'm trying to do here is put the word in your heart so that you can carry the word and teach others. So that you can go and carry the word and influence others. Uh, this is about a reproducing discipleship model uh, of what we're building so that you become activated. Okay, so being a leader into the world. And Jesus was speaking about the protocols of the culture of the kingdom of God during the Sermon on the Mount of Olives. Remember that? He went to the Mount of Olives and he spoke the Beatitudes and a whole lot of other teachings. And he called his disciples into their prophetic destiny. And the church is mandated as a city on a hill. And this takes a, a, a consistent but unique meaning. And this is what he said to them. You are the salt of the earth. Now, now note the tense. You are. You're not, it's not you're going to be one day. You are. What's he doing? He's calling out what's already in them. He already knows their future, right? Every present word of God has the future in mind. He's calling out, right? I'm telling you who you are. This is who you are. You are. Now that you in the Greek is a double emphasis, and it means this. You and only you. There's emphasis. He's, he, he's, he's challenging them. Say, this is who you really are in the world. You are salt. 
Now that had a particular meaning to them. And Bob, the Bible interprets the Bible. It should have salted the earth. But if salt loses its flavor, how can it be made salty again? Salt's different than the thing it impacts. It's not the same. It's got properties that causes it to influence what it comes into contact with. But it's not the same. And you'll soon see what is he saying. If you as the church look exactly the same as the spirit of this age, then you cannot influence it. You've lost your saltiness. And what happens when you lose your saltiness? Look what he says. It's no longer good for anything. Wow. We become impotent as the church. Except to be thrown out and trampled upon by people. Let me tell you right now, we are no longer having the influence of the church we once did. In a post-modern, post-Christian world, it's a challenge for us. That's why we need to talk about this. Does that make sense? We, we no longer have the voice of integrity to the world. The church is on the nose to a lot of people. And, and whether you say, oh, that's just them, that's just the denomination, or it's just that person, people in the street don't distinguish between denominations. And they associate the church with God. So if the church is on the nose, God is on the nose. At the moment, there's also a spiritual move against truth, God's truth. It's part of a cultural shift. So we're in very many real ways having to deal with culture in a different way than we've ever had to deal with culture before. Does it make sense to you? In other words, we have to understand the times and the seasons that we're living in. And then Jesus says to his disciples, you are the light of the world. A city located on a hill cannot be hidden. People do not light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand that gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so that they can see your good deeds. So they can see the expression of Christ in you. Do, do you see that? So, so, so what is he saying? What, lay this back into Isaiah 60. When a king's going to come to our writing because we, because we have a good philosophy, because we talk... A talk, but don't walk the walk? Is the world wanting more talk? Or is it wanting leadership modelling the convictions and the values, the internal culture of living in Christ and letting it be seen through our actions and the way we live to everyone around us? And my bet is that there is a move of the Holy Spirit where there is great darkness, there is also a great harvest. You see, when we take people out of the world, what are we bringing them into? When we deliver people out of bondage and the oppression, spiritual oppression of the world, and I'll show you through Isaiah 61, who Jesus targeted, then what are we going to bring them into? If you remember Jesus, he was very critical of the religious elite. Has everyone read the Gospels? Now, I'm not going to drill down on that, but I am going to say that for a reason. Because they were meant to bring them into the kingdom. They were meant to be the light into the darkness. In the same way, Israel was meant to be the light to the nations around them. But Israel wanted to be like the nations around them instead of influencing the nations around them. Are you with me? Am I making sense today? Yeah. So we can see that, that there is this prophetic future that God is calling out. I want you to be salt and I want you to be um, light into the world. And then Jesus finishes his sermon on the mount by saying this. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them. I'm going to pause there. Everyone who hears these words of mine and he does them, builds. 
But if you hear the words and you don't do anything with them, you're not building anything. So that when the storms come, when the rain comes, when the wind comes, it's a picture of adversity in your world, you build on sand and you get washed away. You're unstable. But when you take these revelatory words and you take them to heart and you build upon them in your life, you are building on the rock. And we know who the rock is. It's Jesus. He's the rock. We're going to build on the rock. And if you build on a rock, then you're going to build in an unshakable kingdom. Unshakable. It means when everything else is oscillating, vibrating in calamity and turmoil and fear, your rock solid in the government of his peace. And you have hope and vision in the mess. Yeah. Not the right place? Yeah. That's what we want. Yeah. So we so there's some keys here for us that give us stability, confidence, and a faith hope into the future. For anyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man. He wants to be wise. He's like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Then rain fell, the flood came, and the winds beat against that house. What's he saying? You're not going to have a picnic just because you built a nice house. There's this idea, unfortunately, that because I'm blessed and because I'm prosperous, I'm going to have no adversity in my life. I don't know about you, I'm 60 years old, and I don't think that's quite right. <laughs> that's not been the case. And in fact, my experience, which is lines up with the Bible, and I had to learn this, was every time there's adversity, every time there's a storm, guess what? Great opportunity for increase in growth. Great opportunity to see that I did build in the good times in the right place. I built on the rock. I did the small things when it mattered. I listened to that word and systematically I built a house that had solid foundations. And when the, when, when the world starts to shake and, and the dark powers of the world start to trade, I'm unshakable. I'm not going to trade out of what I'm building. Does that make sense? So we can see that it's really important. But Jesus, Jesus went on to complete that teaching on the Sermon of the Mount. And when he was finished saying all the things about the kingdom, we can I suggest to you that that, that, read, that scripture, if you want to know the protocols and how the ways of God work in the world, Jesus was outlining them. They're all about the kingdom. It's all, the, the Beatitudes and that teaching and praying and humility of heart, all those things, is all about how you bring forward the kingdom, how you become salt and light into the world. And he, he, they said this, the crowds were amazed by his teaching because he taught them like one who had authority, not like their experts in the law. Now the experts in the law were the Pharisees and the teachers. He had this authority. And uh, for those that have been around me for a while, you know, it's my favorite little word. It's called Shinoch in the Hebrew. It's Shmiel. It means it's an authority that came from God to set people free and empower them. He wasn't preaching a religious, intellectual message. He was preaching from the revelatory realm of God, heaven invading earth through what he was teaching and the anointing of what he was carrying through the union with the Father. Every believer... Every believer is to come under that authority to carry authority. Shmiloth means that he was able to teach his own teaching that came directly from the Father. What can we conclude out of that? That Jesus is perfect theology. Jesus is perfect theology. What he is saying is not a maybe. It is. It's not an intellectual, oh, I reckon the world is like this. Jesus didn't roll like that. He said, these words of mine, they come from the Father. And no one's seen the Father except me. But I've come from him. 
And I've come to you to reveal what he's saying to me so you'll walk in it and you'll have life. That's pretty profound for me. And he says, not only am I going to bring forward a revelation, I'm going to model to you as the first of many brothers, which means sisters as well. Many of you will inherit the kingdom. I'll model to you on earth how you can do it in humanity filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, he was perfect. He started perfect. We started, well, not so perfect. We started with, with the sin nature. We were born again. But we were born again with whose life in us? When you're born again, you're born again by who? The same life. Jesus becomes a life-giving spirit. That means you, when you are born again, your spirit man is joined with a new nature. It's a divine nature. So the Holy Spirit is working with your new nature, who you really are, and your mind has to catch up to the reality of who you really are. You are salt and you are light. You're not going to become it, you already is. God has made up his mind about this. Does that make sense? He's calling forward a prophetic destiny over a church. And that, that what he's saying is, you need to become this, not only for your sake, but to establish the very thing that I've designed for you to carry to bring forward and usher in the end of this age. Does that make sense? So, yeah, one time you sit back from that and you go, that's pretty big. Are you sure, Paul? Can we just check the fine print? Maybe there's an out here. Uh, you can use your lawyer skills and maybe we'll get a, a clause here that we can get out of. No, no. See, God's not afraid to say who you really are because you're eternally born for that reality. And now God puts his life in you and empowers you through his ability if you give yourself to it to produce the very thing you can't produce by yourself. You see, you can't be light into the world apart from your union with Christ. Does, does that make sense? So when we try to do things in the flesh, we come up empty-handed, and then we pray for a revival. Well, I don't know, if you work in a hospital, you revive something that's not breathing. So we keep going through this process of we need another revival. We need to be revived. We need a bit more mouth to mouth. So God says in this season, all right, I'm going to breathe on you. But it's not for what you think. It's for you to arise and shine, to get out of your slumber, take the veil off, become powerful, so that kings can come to your rising. I've called you to be an influencer. I've called you to be a culture shaper. I've called you to be salt, to change the reality of the world in you and the world around you. So that you may set a city and a nation free. Wow. Small steps towards a big vision. <laughs> Amen. All right. So I think we have to live in a time of great opportunity. And I believe every generation does. However, that opportunity often presents itself in times of adversity and calamity. The greatest moment of increase is where you get a choice to be veiled by fear or to be embraced by faith. Everyone's heard me talk about Psalm 23, right? And the two aspects of Psalm 23. And we like to spend, by the way, it's not a psalm for funerals, it's actually for our life. And um, Psalm 23 is this powerful, powerful revelation that David had that he said, I'm, I'm with you on the mountaintops, you give me refreshing, you lay me down, I get filled up with you, I get amazing times with you, I'm in the glory, I'm in the presence. And there's a sneaky little verse in the Passion Translation, and the Spirit leads me into the valley of the shadow. And, well, sorry, I better read that again. The Spirit leads me. Why does the Spirit lead you 
into the valley of the shadow of death because that's where light shines. That's where salt changes the atmosphere. It changes the culture. And God says when you're in the moment of adversity is your greatest opportunity of increase because I hide you in me. The glory is upon you. The glory is in you. I hide you in me. I set a table for you of a provision and I anoint you in a way you can't get when you're on the mountaintop. But if fear is overwhelming your psychology, your thinking in your mind, you will think in a sin punishment culture, what have I done wrong? And why has God led me here? I must be being punished. Anyone thought like that? But I read the Bible very differently. I read the Bible that there are these amazing men and women walking with God and adversity came their way. Why? For their increase. God picked battles for Israel for them to win. Oh my goodness. I'm getting to preach it now. <laughs> Revelation says that, that Jesus rides on the clouds. What's he doing? He's picking fights for us to win. He leads you to a place of your increase so that you can overcome the fear in you to overcome the fear around you that you'll be like and salt and a solution to others who are living in fear and bondage. So we live in great opportunity. We've got to get past fear. We've got to recognize our fear. And can I say, our first response, our default position, our carnality that's still in us, is fear, loss and lack. Right? So, so, so when something comes towards us, we respond, we learn how to respond immediately to what's coming before us. Do you know that is a limited response? Do you know that is, that is your primary response as a human? And it's a defensive response. And in the moment of defending your space because of fear, you do not engage in a God response. And that is the plan of darkness to keep you attacked under fear, to keep you out of establishing the order and the prophetic destiny of God on your life. It's making sense to you. So, what does God say? He says, come on, I've called you to something more. Light is made for darkness. So, so how do we respond then when things are coming at us? We recognize our response. We become self-governing and responsible in the Spirit of God. And we go, wow, Lord, I'm feeling anxious in this moment. I'm feeling fearful in this moment. I've got the fear of black. I've got the fear of rejection. I've got the fear that this is not going well. I'm going to acknowledge fear. Why? Because once I become acknowledged of what I'm in, I can find a solution in Him. Does that make sense? So I feel these things going on. I, that's not my space. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never creates fear and condemnation. Ever. That is not the Holy Spirit. And what, what casts out fear is perfect love. It's not an emotional somebody giving me a hug. It's God's love is an order of his government. It's his very nature. The kingdom is based on the foundation of who God is. His love. And so when his love comes in, it drives out that anxiety, that fear, because you give yourself to that which operates at a higher realm, to that which operates at the lower realm. Yeah. If I use language of frequency, it might freak a few people out. But, but you will know. Let me give you an example. When you're in a fearful situation, do you ever ever feel like everything's like, it, 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 like what the heck? Do you feel locked up? Do you feel that you can't think properly? 
You think you now got to make an immediate response to the fear that's coming at you. Instead of taking a step back, taking a big breath, and breathing your way into space and saying, Lord, I don't trade into fear. You've given me a sound mind. You've given me your spirit. You've given me union with you. Now, how do I respond to the situation that's hand? And that is the moment where God imparts his wisdom to you. And where he imparts his present word, he anoints you. Because his present word comes forward with both his government and his anointing to do the very thing he's asking you to step into. At that moment, when you put that present word, and you often will move in the opposite spirit, you dismantle the impotence of the fear that's coming against you, that's trying to intimidate you. That's how you dismantle the moment you step in and give action to the realm of love and peace. You move at a higher realm and govern over the fear. And you drive it out. And not only do you drive it out, you set the person free who's been operating by the fear towards you. Does that make sense? What often happens is when we get into a fear-driven situation or where our liberties are removed or those things are removed, we get into a response mechanism. And we tend to trade in the same spirit as that that's coming against us. And so what it is is flesh versus the flesh. But we put religious language on it. That's not going to be effective. You've attacked me, I'll attack you. Jesus says, move in the opposite spirit. Now it doesn't mean you can't be discerning. But when you're moving in the spirit of fear, you cannot also be moving by the Holy Spirit and the government of his peace. It's the humility and the government of peace which gives you a present wisdom that God imparts to you for the situation that's at hand. Salt and light. Being salt and light. So we're constantly looking for God's solution to the present problem to bring forward the kingdom. Will you have adversity? Yes. Will you have trouble in the world? Will you have good days and bad days? Alright. So when you're having a bad day, everything seems to close in on you. Sometimes you need to let a bad day just be a bad day and go and worship the Lord. And thank you. Not for the bad day, <laughs> for who he is. Now, if you read the Psalms, this wonderful Prozac king, David, <laughs> who was more depressed than he'll ever be, but he was wrestling in this constant reality. The world that he was living in was not all ticking burden. It wasn't all going well for him. And he had people that lied about him, slandering him, working against his kingship. And he would, he would confess, he would bring all those concerns to the Lord, and then there would be a shift in the sun. But you, God, this is how my flesh is feeling, but I'm not going to stay there. I'm going to actually present it to you as a sacrifice of praise. Mm, yes. mm. Why? So I can be powerful by the end of this song. Does that make sense? Mm. So he comes in. In one way, but he leaves the atmosphere of the presence of God empowered, invigorated, envisioned, and he's ready for the next obstacle. And sure enough, the next obstacle comes. There'll be times of conflict, there'll be times of peace. It's how you govern your heart is the determining factor whether you'll be salt and light into the world. I hope I'm making sense for you. Now remember this that you're right, that you're anointed to be salt and light. You're anointed. That means God put himself on you. So you've got God in you, your union with Christ, and, and I'll unpack that a bit more probably next week, but you've got this union with Christ, but you're also anointed. That means God's on you and God's in you to be soul and light. Everything you're doing, if you're yielding to that power, if you're yielding to the anointing, you're bypassing your best ability. 
and you're coming into God's ability. Why well, Paul says, I celebrate my weaknesses that he may be glorified through me. There's a point that Paul the Zealot had to come to a place of humility to say, the greatest and most powerful place I can live from is recognizing my weakness. And that the situation at hand can only be done by God living in me and upon me and through the anointing he's given me and the wisdom he's given me, I can dismantle that and keep going. I will move from a government of peace into a government of turmoil. The government of peace trumps calamity. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. That means, and the government is upon His shoulders. So there's a development in all of this. As I said, what? To us, a child, sorry, yeah, a child is born, but a son is given. See, so you're a child that's born again, but you've got to become a son. It's in that growth of spiritual maturity that you learn to be an overcomer, and more and more what happens is the government of that peace is in you and rests upon you. Jesus said in John 14, my peace I give you, not a peace that's like the world. It's not temporary and fading, it's supernatural. It's a government realm on you that keeps you in my rest, knowing God's greater than anything you're confronting. And God's solution in the moment will disarm and dismantle what is coming against you. We need wisdom. Not just sin. Let me demonstrate that a bit. Because it's pretty interesting for me that Jesus, when Jesus is saying uh, about the poor, salt and light is not inconsistent with his license to mind. So Jesus says, I'm anointed. Remember, he sits down in the temple. I've taught this before here. He sits down in the temple and he says, today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. What does he say? The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. To do what? To do what? To preach good news to the poor. To be light and salt into the world that they may be free. Okay, that's, that's the connection here. When, when Jesus is talking about that, when he's talking about the poor, he has a particular group of people in mind. Now what we've done in the modern church is we've identified the poor as those who are financially poor. And that's true. That, that is very much a part of it. And, and of those, that class of people... Jesus said, you always have them with you. You'll always have the financially poor. But, but Jesus was speaking into a context. And you may or may not know this, but the, the, the poor were not just the financially poor, but the spiritually poor. Now, the spiritually poor and the financially poor seem to have worked together. This is my experience when I go into third world nations. God moves powerfully in third world nations. And, and I've, I've always had this question, how can he move so powerfully in third world nations? But you come back to Adelaide and you wonder if you've still got the same anointing. It's there. It's not about your anointing. It's about how the anointing's received. This is the key to preaching the good news to the Poor. You see, the quality of the poor, and from what the Bible speaks about, is they have humility of heart because they recognize their poverty. They recognize that they were spiritually bankrupt, let alone financially poor, that they were the disadvantaged in the world. And they needed the advantage of Jesus. Now, the church in Laodicea had forgotten about the advantage. The church at Laodicea had forgotten the advantage of being with Jesus because it had become materially rich. And what did Jesus call out? He's not condemning them. He's realigning them 
to say, you've lost the humility of heart. You don't see anymore how wretched and poor you really are. And if you did, you'd lay hold of me again and you would be powerful as a church into the context you're in. So when judgment begins with the house of the Lord, it's not condemning, he's bringing order back into the church to say, hey, I'm trying to show you the true condition of your heart. You become veiled by the spirit of the world or you become veiled by the spirit of religion. But what's happening is you don't, you, you, you've moved on from me. You came to me, I built with you, but now you're building without me because you've become rich and spiritually elite. Now you go, well, come on, that's a bit harsh. It's exactly what happened in the day of Jesus. You see, what we, we, we need to understand what he's doing here. So that we, we had different groups. 90%, 90% of the people that Jesus was around him were the common people of Palestine. These people, the religious elite in their various groups, rejected. Wouldn't go near, wouldn't touch. That's pretty interesting. Isn't it? The major religious groups were comprised of the Pharisees, and they had at least seven subdivisions. You think the church is divided today? There's nothing new under the sun. All has a different expression. So they comprised the Pharisees, divided into seven or more groups, and they were the fundamentalists of the day. And then you have the Sadducees, were like the progressives or the liberalists of the day. And then you had the Zealots, who were the radical advocates. And then you had the Essenes, who were effectively the monastic spiritual group of the day who largely separated themselves from the community. Now, you think, oh, we're not going to be like that in the church today. <laughs> we take on one or more of these in our different expressions. And I'm not being critical here. I'm just, I'm just trying to pull the veil on something so we can get understanding how we can all easily slip into this. And, and what effectively was happening is that these spiritual groups, the researchers revealed, uh, they would reject what was known as the am Haretz, the A-M, second word, H-A-R-E-T-Z, and they were common people of the land, as I said. In, in rabbinical literature, they're a little bit described for different reasons. But these people were despised by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who it was suggested is they were poor because God was displeased with them. They were operating in spiritual elitism. Now, who were the ones that came to Jesus and who were the ones that rejected Jesus? This group I'm talking about, this 10%, were the ones that put Jesus on the cross. They rejected him. Their hearts were veiled to accomplish God's purposes, albeit, but their hearts were bad. Can we become elitist spiritually and become arrogant to the assignment that we've been called to? Then do we bail ourselves and separate from the very people we're called to influence, bring lying and solitude? You see, the realignment that God has to bring to the church is so that we can come back to the foundation of the prophetic destiny we've been anointed to fulfill in society. The church is to be empowered and mobilized into the world to be leaders in the world so that kings will come to our rising. Right at the moment, there's not too many that can qualify for that state then could it be in this year God is bringing through the calamity, through the fear, through whatever is going on with COVID, a re of our heart 
to come back into our union with God, to see who we really are, to approach the world from a different place than we've been approaching it from. To approach it from the fullness of Christ that dwells within us, with the knowledge we are salt and light into the world. We are leaders that are designed to change the atmosphere, to change the culture by what we live and where we live from into the world. It can't start out there until it starts in here. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Session one done. But a good invitation, hopefully, and I'll unpack how we live in our union next week and I'll take you through all the scriptures and you'll see this come to life. But I just want to pray for a moment. I know there's that people watching at home and I just want to take a moment to pray. Mm -hmm. Test this in the scriptures. Go to the scriptures, see the pattern, see what I'm talking about. Um, and, and I'll publish my notes uh, as well. I'll publish them online so they're available for people. And you can systematically go through the scriptures. I want you to go to the scriptures prayerfully. Not with condemnation. It's not what this is about. This is about getting your power coming back into alignment and understanding the genuine power of Christ's glory in you. You look like clay charts. We're a bit fragile, maybe a little bit broken. But what Paul says in Corinthians that I'll talk about next week is when you come under pressure, what comes out is not your brokenness. It's the glory of God. Jehovah's sneaky. <laughs> the world thinks it's winning. And God sees it as opportunity for him to shine through you, his life to shine through you. That way, the knowledge of the glory of God covers you know, in our brokenness, in our imperfection, and his perfection being made perfect by expression. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today, we thank you for this opportunity to reassess and realign, to come back into the point of alignment with our union with you. And Lord, we, we, like everyone else in our vulnerability, can be drawn into fear paradigms and fear of this and fear of that. And adversity at times can be overwhelming. We can become anxious and we can lose our peace. And sadly, we can lose our joy. But Lord, I pray today that there would be a real moment through the Spirit, that this would be something of a plumb line message, that you, Father, would choose to breathe upon, that you would open up hearts, you would bring things back into alignment, that you would activate destinies in those that have heard this message, that above all, we would reestablish our connection in you, our union in you. And Lord, where, where we've been at doing things in our own effort, Lord, we surrender that course and we, we come back to living yielded, knowing that you are faithful, knowing above everything that's coming against us that the government of your peace that's within us is more powerful than anything going on around us. Bring us back into heavenly order. Bring us back into a mind that is your mind, that a spirit is able to overcome the things of the world, that you would bring us back into that heart that resonates with our heart, that we would know that we are again building on the rock, that the storms won't affect what we're building. It'll only be opportunity to increase as we go forward. Bring forward the revelation, wisdom, and understanding into our heart that each step we take until we meet again will be empowered and led by you, that we will move in your favour, that we will be salt and light this week to the measure that we're living in here. In Jesus' name. Amen. I think we're saying goodbye to uh, our YouTube um, people. Bless you. Uh, hopefully you got something out of this message today and uh, you'll be back online next week.
If you're at home and you're suffering from COVID, we just really pray that God's healing power uh, will just drive that sickness out of you. And more than that, that you will have the government of his peace that you'll use the time to your advantage, that you won't be frustrated uh, as much as that is attractive, that you, you'll use this time that God will speak to you, that he will establish you and him uh, in the waiting. So, uh, amen to that. All right, my friends. Who, um, who needs to be prayed for? Do we need to activate anything in this room? That was a rhetorical question. <laughs> um, so, let's not be shy. Who, who today actually said, you know, listen to that? Actually, no, I'm a bit out of order. I'm out of order. You know? Yeah. So, if you feel that that message today for you was a real alarming message, you step up. Now, there's no shame in this. It's not about uh, points on the board. This is about us getting free, us getting empowered, us getting activated, because God wants to use us this week. You know, I, I understand this, that, um, can, can I just say this? There, there is a favour that's going to land on people, and you're going to have influence where you've never had influence. God's going to open doors to the middle and open to you. And what's going to happen is he's going to actually step through them. But the first thing you're going to be confronted with is the spirit of fear. The spirit of, I'm not good enough. I don't know enough. Right? And I want to tell you, that's got no place to me. Yeah. You're anointed for what God is going to bring your way this week. You're anointed. Now, the key is to walk with humility. And we know that's our values here. Yeah. The key is to walk with humility, not any self-righteousness or spiritual leaders. I know I need God every day, no matter how much I grow and I'm established in Him. The greatest failure I can come into is that I know a few things. I stop learning. I stop depending. And I become comfortable in my own space. Comfort is the limiting factor of growth. Being comfortable in what you know and what you've experienced is your limitation to God's increase in this next season. So it's not about what we know, it's about what we're learning. It's what he wants to show us, what he wants to teach us and establish us. So I'm going to release a prayer, and it's up to you how you want to receive that. If you want to pray as well, uh, feel free to pray. But we're just going to release a prayer. This is a fresh anointing, there's a fresh empowerment. You see, your faith responds, God responds to it. And, and, and what's beautiful about this is we're saying, I haven't got it all worked out yet. I need, I, I, I need you, Lord. I know you're with me, but I need to understand that in a new way. I need to learn how to live in this union and this government peace in a deeper way. So, Father, I thank you for this faith response that you will land on. I thank you, Father, that you are bringing us into a deeper place, into the, our union with Christ. And I thank you, Father, for the government of peace and the empowerment that you will give us to break off every pattern of thinking that has been limited. However it's been established in our psyche, whether it's recent or whether it's ancient. And we break off together. We pray together to break off that, that, that wrong thinking that has created imprisonment, that has created bondage, that has created limitation. And we ask now by the power of your word that you would pierce our hearts, set us free, and renew our mind to the realities you're showing us. That this week may be the freest week we've ever lived in. And when the enemy wants to trade into fear and lock us out of what you bring us into, we're going to laugh because we know the strategy. You've already given us the heads up of how it's going to come against us because you've already given us the solution. We're going to move in the opposite spirit to the world this week, Lord, so that you may be glorified. All of this is to the glory of your name. That's what Jesus said. It's not to the glory of our name. It's so that you receive the glory because it's your life in us that's shining through us. And Lord, to teach us how to yield to that reality intuitively 
responsibly, lovingly, knowing that you do that because you love us and you are for us and you want us to come into everything that you've already written on our scroll. In Jesus' name, amen. So I bless you. Uh, we're going to wrap it up there. And uh, hopefully something impacted you this week.